This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. It's Monday. And it's July 1st. And the word of the day is malversation, which means corrupt behavior in public office. Huh. Used in a sentence, in a grand act of malversation, the Supreme Court legalized malversation last <laughs> week. And that was far from the worst thing they did that week. Yeah, and the SCOTUS wasn't even the branch of government that gave us the worst news this week. No. Yeah, but like if they waited until Trump was back in office to legalize corruption, that would have just been way too obvious what they Fair. were doing. So yeah. They had to do it now. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America and across the pond, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, the Tory party will have some bad luck at the bookies. Boeing will take aircraft failure to new heights. And the New York Times editorial board wants to take Joe Biden to a farm upstate. <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Michael Marshall. Gentlemen, it's election season in both the U.S. and the U.K. Somewhat different outlooks for each of those. So, uh, Marsh... Will you and Nicola marry us, please? <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, I mean, you're welcome to seek asylum here, but you should probably Google what we do with refugees first. Uh, yeah, oh, no, that's okay. I'm sure Australia... Will... God damn it. Well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In our lead story tonight, Joe Biden lost that debate. Yeah. Not a good mm, showing. No. Lost it pretty bad. Donald Trump didn't win. He was just lying the entire time. So he didn't win by any reasonable measure of content, but Joe Biden lost. And as much as I'd love it, if logical and factual content would determine the winner, that's not how it works. In practical terms, a shift among voters is what determines the actual winner. And on that front, we actually have some good news within the bad news, I guess. The debate didn't really do anything. As weak as Biden's performance was, the effect on voters was minor. A poll by CNN found that only 5% of voters changed their minds after watching the debate, and that was split about evenly between Trump and Biden. Another poll by Ipsos found that pre-debate, 44% of people were at least considering Biden, and post-debate, it was actually up to 46% somehow. For Trump, it was 44% before and after. All that being said, a huge swath of Democrats, including the New York Times editorial board, lost their goddamn minds after one bad debate and immediately called for Joe Biden to cut his belly out with a sword and resign from the race, and drift away on a noble ice flow. So I guess there's one way a debate can have a major effect on the election. One side could become maniacally insane after losing one debate and completely implode. And apparently that's the ledge we're on right now. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't get a chance to watch the debate until Saturday morning, so I'd already seen all the apocalyptic reviews, and I was shocked by how abysmal it wasn't, really, at that point, once I'd set my expectations there. Like, it was bad, but it didn't strike me as campaign ending. Now, of course, to be fair, I was watching it on one and a half speed, and at that speed, Biden is downright spry, so... <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I mean, you guys probably don't think I can empathize with a country that's losing its mind and calling for major change because the guy they support was sluggish, confused and uninspiring. But bear in mind, I've watched four England games at the Euros in this last fortnight, so I'm there with you. We need a bicycle kick by Biden in the 95th minute. So before we get into the aftermath, let's talk about the debate itself. It started with Joe Biden walking on stage and saying hello like those were his last words on <laughs> earth. <laughs> he said, hey, folks, how are you? But as if he just got stabbed in an old timey war and was telling his war buddy to like let him go and keep fighting, you know, like go, 
Go. <laughs> and this is where I fired up a very dangerous drinking game uh, against myself. It's called Drink versus Drink. Do not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> so according to Biden's campaign team, he had a cold. Okay, fine. But it sounded like he had a plague, a death. And then Trump walked on stage and said absolutely nothing like a serial killer, which was good enough to win the hello segment. Not a good start. But, you know, also that's nothing. Well, this was also approximately the point where my social media feed declared Trump the winner. Sure. Yeah, social media. <laughs> it's just so harsh and unfair in its judgments. I think Biden, he he was just doing a millennial pause. It's just from a previous millennium. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so they start the questions with topics that included tax policy, inflation, climate change, abortion, COVID, immigration, uh, that one time Trump led a failed coup against the American democracy, mm -hmm. and of course, golf. And here's the general pattern, which continued for pretty much the entire 90 minutes. Trump would answer with a very confident lie. For example, blue states are doing after birth abortion. He genuinely said and that multiple he times. Did he genuinely did. say that, exact words. And then Biden would kind of rasp and mumble through his honest answer and also somehow managed to get a number wrong by one to three orders of magnitude <laughs> yes. during every single answer. Even the ones that didn't have numbers, he somehow did that. Yeah, yeah. No, Heath read a list of topics that the questions covered. There's a much shorter list of topics that the answers covered, though. <laughs> yeah, that's how debates go. To Biden's credit, he, he would usually call out the lie by Trump in the rebuttal round, and he'd sometimes correct himself on the numbers as he was going, but he rarely sounded clear and confident during his own content. During the first segment, Biden mentioned an excellent achievement, a bill that capped the price of insulin. But he got the numbers wrong, both for the cap and for the amount people were paying before the bill took effect. He also claimed that he inherited 9% inflation from Trump, which is just entirely wrong. And at one moment, Biden stalled in the middle of a sentence mm -hmm. and failed to finish his thought before his time was up. Really, really bad. Trump, on the other hand, was actually using an obnoxiously good strategy from his coaching team that I want to mention here, an issue would be over and the moderators would ask a new question. But Trump would just use his first segment on the new question to get the last word about the old question. And then the moderators would end up re-asking the question so Trump would still be able to answer that new question if he wanted to. Bottom line, we got out-coached really hard and that needs to get fixed. Okay, are we sure that was coaching though? And not just like another example of where the system's system like vulnerable to someone being as much of a dick as Trump just naturally is. Like <laughs> all of your political norms are the Death Star and the exhaust pipe is the exact size of an entitled elderly asshole. Yeah. <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. And of course, we should also mention that Trump made liberal use of the Gish Gallop. Right. The debate yeah. strategy where you just take advantage of the fact that lies take less time to say than to correct. And there's no mechanism in the debate that awards you bonus minutes when the stuff you're saying is true. Right. Yeah, he did. And it's it's unfair to use a gish gallop on Biden. Like even a gish gentle trot would feel like overkill. By really? <laughs> honestly. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so I'm hoping we can all set aside the bad optics and they were bad, at least for now, and focus a bit more on the content itself. And if you have to argue with a shitty Republican uncle, for example, or try and talk sense to an undecided voter, taxes and the economy are key to those people. And Trump lied the whole time about everything, including economy tax stuff. According to Trump, quote, Biden wants to raise your taxes four times. What? Incorrect. <laughs> Biden's tax plan would raise taxes on families making more than $400,000 a year. That's not your taxes that's hardly anyone and if you really want to reach that shitty uncle you can mention that taxes pay for cops and firefighters and soldiers they love that stuff and yeah and also like boring nerd stuff like roads and schools and social security but that last one your shitty uncle is gonna need it yeah uh-huh also why would biden raise them four different times people come on think about it he just he would pull <laughs> off the pin that's stupid yeah maybe it's like when you fill in your car you know you get most of the way there with the first tax and you give it a few extra squeezes to get to a round number <laughs> yeah. you know, Biden's gonna have taxing everyone a tenth of a cent more than he was aiming for and he's gonna be so mad about it <laughs> so trump also claimed that he presided over quote the 
greatest economy in history. Just completely wrong by any metric. Yep. He yeah. also said that by lowering the corporate tax rate, we brought in more revenue with less taxes, also known as upside down economics. Again, verifiably incorrect. I checked it. In 2017, Trump cut the corporate tax from a progressive rate averaging in the high 30s that we had since 1993 down to a flat rate of 21%. During the final year of the old system, we collected $297 billion in corporate tax. And then following Trump's cut over the next three years, compared to that $297 billion, we collected $93 billion less the first year, then $67 billion less the second year, and then $86 billion less the third year. All of that was before COVID hit, by the way. So COVID is not a factor. Corporations didn't like take that free money and grow so much that it would make up for the tax cut. They mostly just kept that free money. Right. Also, we don't abort babies after they're born. I just want to be super clear yeah, on good, that good one to as point well. That out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the silliest moment of the night was the section about golf that I mentioned earlier. And we got full confirmation of my theory that the moment this topic of golf comes up, 99% of golfers become insane yes. liars. Guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> Trump, who, by the way, we've seen drive a cart on the green. What a dick. The worst. He claimed he's an excellent golfer and that he actually won two club wide tournaments recently. Not senior events either. Full club tournaments. And that is just such an obvious, enormous lie. Yeah. I watched a video of his swing just because I was curious. And there is no chance he has ever won a golf tournament or a golf competition of any kind. It's insane. The, the swing is ridiculous. He looks like uh, like an old-timey baseball pitcher doing a crazy wind-up <laughs> with the big kick. <laughs> and then he hits a golf ball. And... Sadly, Biden was clearly lying about golf, too, during this moment. He claimed that during his time as vice president, he was shooting six over par. That's very good. But when Trump questioned that number, Biden immediately said, OK, it, like eight over par. It might have been eight over. Par. <laughs> Everybody is always lying about golf and it's fucking weird. Stop it. Yeah, also hard to say you're focused on the issues that really matter to the American people when you're arguing about your golf handicap in the middle of the goddamn debate. <laughs> yeah. If God, if Biden had just said literally nobody interesting cares about golf, I think he would have got way more support. <laughs> you know, golf, it's a boring game for wealthy people who think that having to move your shoulders once every five minutes makes it a sport. It's not a sport. <laughs> You also have to walk. <laughs> to, yeah, to a little cart. Yeah, right. Yeah, a lot of people use it. Back and forth. So that brings us to the aftermath. I read a bunch of articles calling for Biden to step down. Also some articles on the other side. For me, I think stepping down this late is a net negative in the game theory here. And with Trump as the alternative, all that matters is making sure that Trump loses. Yeah. But I get the instinct. Hopefully... We're all just looking to maximize the odds of winning in November. So I'll try to present some pros and cons and we can think it through. For Team Ice Flow, you're thinking that Joe Biden was already a bit behind in the polls and the debate did not showcase a person who looks like he's going to flip those polls and win. But a new candidate like Kamala Harris or Gretchen Whitmer, Gavin Newsom, Cory Booker, they might generate more excitement. But on the flip side, if I was any of those Democrats with presidential aspirations, I wouldn't want to go anywhere near this weird emergency convention concept without a primary. Yeah. I'd want to wait to the next cycle. And even if those people did step in out of patriotic duty to beat Donald Trump, I'm not convinced that voters get perfectly unified behind whoever takes over. Lots of people imagine their favorite alternative to Biden and feel more inspired. And that includes me. I get it. Like if I could magically insert... Liz Warren or Bernie Sanders or Stacey Abrams into the race instead of Biden with the same polling, that would be great. But that's not how it works. The new matchup could easily be worse. And none of the new candidates ever won a Democratic primary like Biden has. And more importantly, they never won a general election against Donald Trump like Biden has. 
by winning just enough votes in weird purple places like Georgia and Michigan. Yeah, it's like, have you ever started cooking something and then you realised you're using the wrong pan? And the temptation is that it's always, always like switch pans mid-cook. But if you do try and do that, most of the time, you just end up making a huge mess and ruining the meal. And, and <laughs> Biden might have been the wrong pan for this particular stew. But if you try pouring it into a cold Gavin Newsom at this point, you're just going to get vegetables all over your stove. <laughs> right, right. Well, it, it's, it's really telling that the people calling for Biden to step aside aren't all calling for the same person to step into his place, right? Exactly. Right. Like, like, by all rights, it should be Kamala Harris if this is going to happen. But even sure. the people calling for this aren't going to pretend like she would do definitely better in the polls than Biden. Right? She's very unpopular nationally. So we've got this situation where people are arguing, well, at least we know everybody can unify behind X, where X is 11 different fucking people. Have they tried running 11 people? Just like all 11 working as a team. No, you can't get 11 people to work coherently as a team. I've learned that over the last four fucking months. <laughs> So another argument is that a president in their 80s is not ideal in general. And I'd say I agree, I guess, in general. All other things being equal, my perfect candidate is a younger person and someone who would actively dominate Donald Trump on a debate stage. But given the risk of having a new person jump in right now, I think it's worth pointing out that snappy debate answers has pretty much nothing to do with being president and that's because a president is surrounded by expert advisors and presidents make very measured decisions based on those expert advisors in biden's case most of those advisors are not 81 year old white men so just focusing on the age of the one person is a bit overblown i think well and there's every bit of evidence that he's pretty good at being president at 81 right yeah right look at the content one other argument I saw mentioned that Biden dropping out would mess with the Republican convention coming up on July 15th. They'd have to change their plan of criticizing Biden the whole time and be forced to actually have a platform. <laughs> but no, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't do that. They'd spend the whole time correctly pointing out how the Democratic Party is in complete disarray. Right. And sadly, I see that narrative playing very well with weird undecided voters in purple states who shouldn't matter but they very much do right yeah because like if i shit myself in public they'll have to spend all their time talking about how i just shat myself in public that's only a good strategy if they were gonna talk about something worse than the fact you've just shat yourself <laughs> <laughs> right yeah exactly so here's what would have to happen biden would have to release all his delegates and let them pick a new candidate based on this you know, panicky last minute scramble with like old timey smoke filled back rooms. And if we pick Kamala Harris, who I do think would destroy Donald Trump in a debate, she's still working against an extremely low approval rating, whether or not that's deserved. Right. So here's the change that I want to see happen right now. We have the debates and they don't really tell me anything important that I didn't already know. So instead of the debate, I want a big multi-pronged competition like they actually play golf televised official scoring they're both bragging <laughs> about their golf game let's see sure. that on national tv they actually play all the pub games you know they go into the same bar together and they play darts against each other and pool and ping pong and poker and flip cup they play chess i want to see them play chess um then maybe they play chess with butt plugs for signaling you know maybe that's allowed for the second game of chess like i know that would take away the chess part if they're both doing the butt plugs right but maybe they won't do it right i want to learn about how they handle butt stuff now that i think about it the prostate is one of the erogenous zones i want to know what they've learned <laughs> like okay i know butt stuff isn't for everyone that's fine but if we're giving you the nuclear codes i feel like we need to know everything well, how are you gonna do with to butt know stuff? that like yeah can you translate a code in your rectum in real time to a chess move that that tells me a hell of a lot more that's than the a debate. skill that's true right. that is true so what i want now though is a debate where like you get bonus minutes when you say true stuff and lose minutes when you say bullshit <laughs> yes. right and there's a Absolutely. little ding and a buzz buzzer and a red minus one or a green plus one shows up on the screen when you say something true or when you lie yeah yeah that's what oh I want. god yeah either that or if every time you lie the platform you're standing on just drops by an inch like as visual <laughs> representation of the candidate's integrity and like 
the podium could stay in the same place. So right, like, you just yes. have Trump on tip trolls <laughs> trying to reach the mic to yell another line. Yeah, he's like looking around the side of it. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Just yelling out of a big pit by the end of it. I like it. <laughs> so again, I don't think one debate means that Biden should step down. But if that did happen, here's my plan for the hypothetical scenario where Biden does have to leave the race for medical reasons, for example. First of all, we all calm down and realize that one bad debate isn't all the information. If Biden and his advisors and his doctors truly feel he's not fit to serve anymore, they can make that call with the full information. Here's how I want him to do it if that happens. He shows up for the next debate, and when he gets the first question, he announces that he's stepping away, you know, for the good of the country, just like the Republican Party should be doing by picking someone else at their convention if they had a shred of patriotism. But obviously they don't, so that's not going to happen. And the moment that Biden finishes that speech, we hear a deep church bell in the background. Oh, shit. <laughs> and, and Trump looks up in fear and panic. And then Kamala Harris runs on stage, dressed like The Undertaker, gets tagged in by Joe Biden, and she drop kicks Donald Trump in the face. Fuck yeah. And then she tells Trump she's taking over the debate for Biden. And if Trump tries to refuse, she says something like, oh, you, you're afraid to lose to a girl? And Trump is a crazy misogynist lunatic, so he would have to stay at that point. Or I guess he could still walk off. It's a giant win either way. I like... Genuinely, if you take away the WWE part, I actually think that's a good hypothetical strategy. Uh, don't you dare take away the WWE part, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's at least keep the, the entry music or something. I don't know. Enter Sandman's a cool oh, one. Yeah, yeah. A lot of good ways to go. And on that note, I think we've reached a perfect natural segue to a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. So maybe it should be illegal to not own land. Makes the rest of morality so easy. I could probably find some cheap land. I'll be fine. Hey, right? Heath, uh, are, are you are you becoming hey. a Republican again because it looks easier? As, yes. And what did we say about that? We said it's horribly evil and lazy. Horribly evil and lazy, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But they seem so happy, though. Like, you look at Instagram, they're playing golf at Bedminster. They're... Shooting really big guns for no reason. They're rolling coal in their cyber truck. That, that one doesn't even make sense, but they're all smiling. Okay, Heath, I get that you're feeling jealous of their blissful ignorance when you look at Instagram, but those people are actually dead inside. That's not you. To live your best life, you got to okay. focus on what you really want for the world instead of getting distracted by the stupid, vapid existence of others. And therapy might be able to help you get that focus. Therapy? To help with my extremely unhealthy reaction to the world I see on the internet all the time? Really? Really. Therapy can help you learn positive coping skills that aren't turning to the dark side, and it can help empower you to be the best version of yourself. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, maybe give BetterHelp a try. What's... BetterHelp? It's a way to find a therapist who's right for you. It's entirely online, and it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. All right. I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. Okay. Thanks, Noah. Anytime. So, hey, so what's this uh, this big bag of money for? Oh, I'm going to go bribe a politician to do my bidding. Cool. Yeah, that's legal now. Yep. Totally legal. Enjoy. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in specular Tory news, the UK <laughs> election is now less than a week away. And you know, if I'm honest with you, I'm actually feeling pretty conflicted right now. Because on the one hand, we've got the opportunity to see the Tory party comprehensively wiped out, given that they're on course for their lowest vote share of all time, and Sunak polling as the least popular prime minister of all time. Huh. But on the other hand, it will mean an end to what has been the single most enjoyable election campaign of my lifetime. <laughs> I'm, I'm not ready to see it go yet. 
All right, to your credit, Marsh, when you wrote that paragraph, you hadn't seen what Heath's lead story was going to be about yet. So, <laughs> and holy fuck, does it now feel like you're rubbing it in, right? Fair. Yeah, what happened? Did the UK finally put a big tariff on American imports? Like, stupid? Like our cash crop <laughs> of stupid? Maybe trade wars are good sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> So it was literally last episode that I talked about how since they called the election on May 22nd, the Tories have just been stepping on rake after rake. And somehow since then, we've learned that the reason that they had to have all of those rakes in the first place was so they could clear the ground, so they could put down another far larger rake that the entire party could like <laughs> step on altogether. <laughs> so are you against efficiency, Marsh? <laughs> So this new rake, it all started with Craig Williams, who's the Tory candidate for Montgomeryshire and Glendier uh, in Wales. And look, sidebar here, I know the UK has some ridiculously named places and I, I don't know what to tell you. You know, Montgomeryshire and Glendier, you know, you've got this might be the most ridiculous of them. Because just when you think you've hit peak British with the name of an aristocrat combined with an actual shire, they then curveball you with an unbroken <laughs> string of seven consonants, one of which is wearing a little hat. It is. You know, I just I wanted to acknowledge that here now, so we, then we can we can deal with it like adults and move on. It always sounds like you're naming the doomed knight, the dragon who killed it, or in this case, both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as well as being the MP for that place, uh, Williams had also been senior aide to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, which means he was one of the people who got advance notice of the date of the election when Sunak was going to announce it. And we know that he got advance notice because the first thing he did was head straight to a bookies to place a £100 bet on the exact date the election would be. And he's now been suspended by the Tory party, meaning he can still run to be an MP in this election. But on the off chance that he does win, he'll have to sit as an independent and not a Tory. That's his punishment, is not being able to be a Tory anymore. Um, he's also being investigated by the Gambling Commission because it's actually illegal to misuse inside information in order to put bets on that you know for sure are going to win. And I don't know. I genuinely don't know what's the most disappointing aspect of this. The fact that he placed the bet in the first place, given that he was that he was in one of the safest Tory seats in Wales, he didn't have to do anything to win, probably. Or the fact that he only bet one hundred pounds at five to one yeah. odds on Thank something you. he knew for a fact was definitely going to happen. <laughs> Or that he was stupid enough to use the inside information of bookmakers rather than use it on the stock market like everybody else. <laughs> it was the second. The second one. Look, look, I was half expecting you to say the gambling commission was investigating why he gambled so badly, right? Why, why didn't you just put any real fucking money down, man? Yeah. yeah, right. So apparently he's a grown man with access to approximately a medium piggy bank of life savings. <laughs> Which, like, that doesn't bother me, but that should bother a bunch of snobby Tories. And also, he doesn't have one single friend who right. would make the bet for him. Well, I mean, he's a Welsh Tory, so no, he's the only one. He doesn't know another one. <laughs> Still, if he was that stupid, he wasn't alone in being that stupid because a week later, we learned that a second Tory prospective MP had done exactly the same thing. This is Laura Sanders, who was standing in Bristol Northwest, and whose husband just so happens to be the Tories' director of campaign, so he had this information. And then a few days later, we learned that Russell George, a Tory member for the Welsh Parliament, is also being investigated for placing a bet on the date of the election. In fact, we're now up to at least 15 Tory candidates and officials who are currently under what? investigation, as well as six police officers who were part of their security team and put bets oh, on as well. Jesus Christ. So, wait, we're at 21 fucking people. I'm z I'd be 0% surprised at this point if we find out that Sunak picked the day because that had the biggest payout. Outs, right? <laughs> and, and that doesn't even include the most recent revelation that Tory MP and former bookmaker Philip Davies, in the full knowledge that the election will go very badly next week, put an £8,000 bet on himself to lose his seat. He bet against himself. Apparently, that's not illegal to bet against yourself. What? Really? And yeah, he should know that given that he's a former bookmaker. He's also received like £100,000 in donations from the gambling industry. And he was the chairman of the parliamentary committee that regulates gambling in the oh, first place. Oh, my sake. I feel like this is one of those, like, it's illegal because we assumed nobody would be dumb enough to do it situations, but <laughs> right. maybe not. <laughs> okay. Now I want to see slow motion video on, like, British ESPN of this guy doing 
really bad speeches on purpose to like throw it. <laughs> Scott Van Pelt diagramming his form, yeah, Sean, yeah. where he like obviously. <laughs> Honestly, the only thing missing from this is for us to find out that Liz Truss also put an insider information bet on the date of the general election and somehow lost. That's what I'm waiting to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out her money was on the lettuce the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> she walks away slowly. Her limp goes away. <laughs> Takes out a head of lettuce and bites it like an ass. <laughs> And oh, the best thing about this is <laughs> that that was going to be dramatic. <laughs> the best thing about this is that this political insider information betting scandal is a completely unforced error, but it's left Sunak's campaign absolutely dead in the water because they were already facing accusations of being out for themselves and not interested in the problems of everyone else in the country. And nothing could confirm that more clearly than using the date of the election as an opportunity to make a quick buck. Yeah. In the US, people would be like, see, savvy businessman. Yeah. <laughs> and my favorite part about it, we only found out today as of recording, is that Labour were watching the odds of when the next election would be, saw the odds drop, and so had a guess that that's when the election was going to be on that date, and bought up all the advertising in newspapers for those dates <laughs> oh, uh, running up to the election. So <laughs> the fact that the Tories like put on their money on this election is what queued Labour off to completely fuck them on the advertising. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely They're brilliant. so stupid. <laughs> so thankfully... Come July the 4th, we'll be seeing the back of this completely corrupt crock of charlatans. Uh, trust me, you can put your money on it. <laughs> and with that in mind, we're going to toss you over to our next advertiser, Policy Genius. So yeah, yeah, I got Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, 456. And then at the end, I got me in the 13th. Yeah, yeah, feeling really good about the team. Uh-huh. Cool. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, I, I gotta go. I'll talk to you later. Hey, Heath. Who was that? Oh, that was my buddy from my fantasy league. We just finished the draft. Seems a little early for a draft. The regular season doesn't start until, what, September 5th? Oh, no, it's not fantasy football. It's celebrity death pool, oh. actually. Yeah, I'm in a bunch of leagues every year, and I always draft myself. I want to make sure Ann and Kai are taken care of when I'm gone. They let you draft yourself? As a celebrity? I, I, I have a blue star on Twitter. Do you, though? I No. Well, Heath, if you're worried about the unpredictability of life and protecting your family with a financial safety net, why don't you try Policy Genius? What's Policy Genius? Oh, you wrote the ads. Gave yourself two points this week, huh? Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace where you can find the right policy for you and your family. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options are 100% online and let you avoid unnecessary medical exams. Okay, but... That does sound like a whole thing. My leagues only take a few hours for each draft. Actually, it's way easier than that. Policy Genius shows you offers from America's top insurers and lets you compare your options in just a few clicks. And their award-winning agents are there to walk you through the process step-by-step step if you need any help. And thanks to the way they have it set up, Policy Genius doesn't have incentives to sell you one company over another so you can trust their guidance. They have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot from happy customers. All right, I'm sold. Where do I go? Get peace of mind by finding the right life insurance with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com or click on the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. Great. Thanks, Noah. No problem. So, hey, so can I check your roster from today? Yeah, 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 take a look. I think my squad's looking pretty good. All right, so in the first round, you drafted Heat? Mm -hmm. like, like the entire basketball team? Heat or? death. They set the age at 99. Oh, got it. No, yeah, that's a good pick. Free point, right? Mm -hmm. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in collage of Farage Entourage's barrage of garbage news. <laughs> 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 With the Tories cratering so <laughs> catastrophically in the polls, it's worth us taking a moment to talk about the new right-wing populist party that's stealing their lunch money right now. That's Reform UK, who used to be known as the Brexit Party and who, in a very small number of polls, have actually come out ahead of the Tories. So Reform are so new that they're not actually a political party at all. Technically, they're a company. Or as their founder and majority shareholder Nigel Farage describes it, an, quote, entrepreneurial political startup. 
Fucking what? Disrupting democracy since 2016. <laughs> what in hell? Reform UK. But apparently that's totally okay because Farage has promised he will, quote, democratise over time, unquote. He just, you know, oh. hasn't given a time scale for when his political party will become democratic. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly not going to happen before the election, which means there's a good chance that reform might win some seats, at which point sitting MPs will be beholden to Nigel Farage Limited. Ugh, and those MPs will definitely have said the phrase sport of business unironically. And that should carry a death penalty. <laughs> yeah, replacing a political party with an LLC seems like a cutting out at the middleman sort of thing. Right. Actually, so. <laughs> so fortunately, it's not going to be very many MPs because reform are a young non-party and they struggle to fulfill their pre-election promise of fielding a candidate in every one of the 650 constituencies of the UK. Like a week before the deadline to even register the candidates, they still had more than 100 new candidates they still had to find. And more crucially, they still had to then vet. But it's fine. They found a workaround to that latter step by just not vetting them. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, that speeds up the process considerably. Okay, this is how you get Matt Gates. Mm -hmm. You want to get Matt Southgate? <laughs> this is how you get Matt Southgate. Okay, that's an unfair comparison because we know that Matt Gates would play the kids. That's unfair. <laughs> This is a joke. So, <laughs> so this party, which which was little more than a policy <laughs> platform compiled from the drunken yellings of middle-aged men getting thrown out of pubs, but with some of the slurs removed, this party had less than a week to find 100 new candidates. But not all the slurs removed. No. You know, right. it, it, it's like how cereal is allowed to have a certain amount of rat shit. Like, mm -hmm. you can't be expected to vet every single neo-Nazi and all their slurs. Yeah, that would not yeah. be tenable. <laughs> so bear in mind, these would be the kind of people drawn to the party, fronted by a guy who looks like scientists gave a toad nicotine poisoning as part of an anti-smoking campaign. <laughs> so if you wondered why your racist Uncle Frank hasn't been arguing with you on Facebook lately, it's probably because he's campaigning to be the MP for North Warwickshire and Bedworth. <laughs> so, uh, he is an expert in politics this week, so yeah. <laughs> But Reform found their candidates, or at least as many as they could. And soon after that, the media found their social media accounts. Mm -hmm. And so it has been a fun couple of weeks. Take, for example, their Barnsley South candidate, David White. So David White was exposed as the head of a cryptocurrency pump and dump called Buddy X. And that's something he denied, but his denial wasn't all that persuasive, given that there's video footage of him promoting this MLM scheme at a sales conference in Thailand, standing in front of, the, in front of this on. glitzy backdrop and asking, does this look like a scam? <laughs> I don't know, David. I can barely see you because the giant screen is showing shiny numbers flying around like... Uh, like the Matrix took way too much Molly at a rave, so I can't see. But I do know that you're standing at a podium at a Holiday Inn Express in Thailand saying the word scam just now. So go on. Tell so, us about your crypto. <laughs> so Reform responded that White isn't actually the head of the company. He just agreed to list himself as their head of UK operations out of politeness. <laughs> oh, out of polite. Yeah, no, hey, look, I agreed to carry this package in my ass out of politeness. How was I supposed to know it was drugs? I didn't yeah, look. Yeah, exactly. I'm a good guy. <laughs> so dozens, dozens of reform candidates have claimed that climate change is a hoax. But in fairness, that's literally in line with reform's official environmental policy. So that's not unexpected. Plenty more of them were found to have likened COVID restrictions to the Holocaust, but again, for this bunch of people, that's kind of par for the course. Well, you yeah, know, their candidate hunt may well have been just searching COVID restrictions plus Holocaust on Twitter, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then there's the reform candidate for the Derbyshire Dales, Edward Oakenfull, who tweeted that sub-Saharan Africans are, quote, diluting the UK's IQ. What? Um, something he told, he told the BBC that had, that had been, quote, taken out of context as part of a political hit job. What? Well, yeah, the original context was hoping you wouldn't hear him say that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what context? Right, I, that I, I demand a context right away, right? Like, okay, yeah, well, tell us the context right now, then. <laughs> and then you've got the Exeter candidate, uh, Lee Bunker. He, he posted on uh, Facebook asking, when will the government deport long-standing Labour MP Diane Abbott? 
someone who it's worth like clarifying was born in the UK and who in 1987 became the, the country's first black female MP. She's been an MP Jesus. since then. And this guy was calling for her to be deported. Um, and then there's Leslie Lilly, who's standing in South End, East and Rochford, who responded to a photo of immigrants arriving by small boats with the threat, quote, I hope I'm near one of these scumbags one day. I won't run away. I'll slaughter them, then have their family taken out. Jesus. Okay, but you already killed them. How do you know who their family is? He doesn't even know how to do a hate crime murder spree in the right order. <laughs> That's <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> So these delightful men were among the one in ten of all reform candidates who were found to be Facebook friends with the UK far-right fascist leader Gary Rakes. Now, unless Rakes was spamming out Facebook invites like the annoying guy you met at a work conference, reform have a clear fascism problem. Okay, so so wait, so they legit vetted their candidates less than I vet requests on Facebook. So <laughs> yes. That is true. Wow. That is true. And speaking of which, while we know that their Bexhill and Battle candidate, Ian Gribben, wanted to appease Hitler, as we covered last time around, we've since learned that their Welwyn Hatfield candidate, Jack Aaron, called Hitler, quote, a brilliant and clear leader with an admirable ability to inspire people to action, unquote. Dude, what are you doing? Yeah, which like, okay... That's technically true. Hitler did get people to act, but I feel like we don't need to give the Nazis credit for their man management <laughs> skills. Okay, no, I was going to use Churchill as my example of, you know, inspiring speech. But Hitler did the open floor plan. I thought <laughs> the hot desking was useful. Pizza Fridays, yeah. <laughs> so Aaron, it turns out, doesn't just fanboy historic Austrians. He also said that the Syrian president and three-time cover star of War Crimes Monthly, Bashar al-Assad, is, quote, gentle by nature. What? And also that Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine was legitimate. And, you know, while we're on the subject of Putin, we have to discuss the elephant in the room, which is just how many reform candidates apparently saw that photo of a topless Putin riding a horse and fantasised about being the horse. My favourite <laughs> of which is Julian Malins, who's standing for MP of Salisbury, and who told a campaign debate, quote, I've actually met Putin and had a 10 minute chat with him and he seemed very good, unquote. Now, Malins is standing as MP for Salisbury the town where agents of Putin used Novichok nerve gas in a botched oh, attempt God. to assassinate Sergei and Yulia Skripal. And I get it, MPs do need to show an interest in local issues, but, but you're supposed to side with the locals and not the foreign dictators and their covert assassins. Ah, it's, it's all about the tourism. You know? <laughs> we have that fun photo spot with your head sticking through the wood next to the stabby umbrella. People <laughs> love that. Oh, Come on. And look, if you're wondering where all the Putin love comes from in reform, we need only look at the head of the party. Sorry, the CEO of the entrepreneurial <laughs> yeah, political right, startup. Right. <laughs> Nigel Farage, as leader of reform, was interviewed last week by the BBC, in which he explained that the invasion of Ukraine was caused by the expansion of NATO and that Russia was provoked into war by the West. This is obvious Kremlin propaganda, and it's not the first sign that Farage is all too cosy with Putin and all too willing to serve Kremlin interests. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, I wouldn't have attacked it if you said I couldn't attack it. Seems like a hard sell, but they're selling it. Yeah, yeah they are. Which, again, this should be a major concern because it looks likely that reform will win at least a couple of seats, possibly even Farage himself in Clacton-on-Sea. Which means that the next parliament will include some MPs who technically work for Nigel Farage, who himself has made pretty clear works for Vladimir Putin. Uh -huh. But that's fine because he's promising to install a proper democracy just as soon as he's accumulated enough power. And <laughs> right. when has a fascist ever lied about that in the past? Jesus. Okay, didn't it feel like Marsh was just ramping up fake British place names to see how <laughs> yeah, far he could go Clacton before we would call him on it? Yeah, it does it it's missing an article <laughs> and everything, yeah. And finally tonight, in Perhaps We Shouldn't Have Named Our Airline Company with a Homophone for Unplanned Structural Warping News. <laughs> last time Marsh and I saw one another, which will be last month by the time this episode airs, oh, we right, watched yeah. the Boeing CST-100 Starliner spacecraft launch two American astronauts to the International Space Station, partly because we're both lovers of scientific advancement and marvel at the technological know-how necessary to break free of Earth's gravity, and partly because Boeing can't even get an airplane from one side of the country to the other without the doors flying off, and failures of that <laughs> magnitude on spacecraft are nothing if not cinematic. 
yeah, to be honest, that's the same reason I agree to come to America. Like, it's it's 50% remarkable achievement, 50% spectacular car crash. Could right, go yeah, no, exactly. Time. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's like a microcosm. Uh, but it did launch successfully, and everything looked good for seconds, even minutes in a row. Uh, but that wouldn't hold, which is why those very same astronauts are still on the ISS, despite the fact that they were originally scheduled to return on June 13th. <laughs> Oof. It's fine. We gave him vouchers for some free tang and pudding <laughs> with purchase of full price meal. But right, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. tang and pudding. Gotta, Discount. I got a rain check. Now, of course, if you listen to our sister show, The Scathing Atheist, you might recall us talking about this mission because among the now stranded passengers is one Barry Butch Wilmore, who is a young Earth creationist, which is exactly one Irona away from an astronaut who's a flat earther. That's actually how the unit of irony is defined. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, I mean, at least the creationist believes that space exists, which puts them one up on most flat earthers. But why send up a creationist? Was Barry just hoping to get a glimpse of God hiding from us behind the moon? Apparently, right, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so but the caveman astronaut was accompanied by actual science person Sonny Williams, who probably came in handy when the ship started popping leaks here and there. No shit, they were popping leaks. Not not like leaks to outer space, but they, they were helium leaks that ran the risk of making the astronauts sound really funny when they checked in with mission control. And those people <laughs> need to keep a serious attitude. And also killing them. It also could have killed them if it had happened. Okay, but that first radio moment of like, Houston, we have a problem. That would have been, that would have been so... <laughs> Fun. Right. No, well, yeah, fun. but like, can you imagine if they managed to kill the first creationist in space? We would never hear the end of yeah, it. Yeah, no, we'd that's hear. fair. Right, right. You'd see the meme of the astronaut shooting him in the back of the head. And just <laughs> no, no caption at all. Yeah. So the helium leaks, and yes, the, that's leaks plural, weren't the only problem with the spacecraft either. The ship was originally supposed to launch four days earlier, but a problem with a ground control computer delayed that. Uh, and there was also a malfunctioning thruster on the ship. And also four other malfunctioning thrusters on this ship. Um, yeah, no, but Boeing is bragging that four out of five of those thrusters are working now. So like 26, 27 of the thrusters work just fine. Unless they need to go down and to the left, this is going to be no problem at all. Yeah, you guys got this. And while you're out there fixing that, um, we were thinking you could caulk the wagon to the Grant. <laughs> Maybe duct tape the doors. It's, it's nothing to worry about, but just just in case. Yeah, are they bragging that they fix 80% of their critical failures? Yes. And that's a brag. <laughs> yep, that's, that's where they're at now. Um, now, for their part, Boeing is very much underplaying the problems with the spaceship and signaling that the astronauts could actually come home anytime they wanted. They just don't want to. Uh, and that I, So there actually might be some truth to that beyond the general desire of all present-day Americans to escape from Earth and never come back. Uh, the, the thruster problems and the helium leaks are both on the ship's service module, which is a module that's going to be jettisoned before re-entry. So their only chance to examine the thing and see what went wrong will be while it's docked to the ISS. Okay, but can't the creationist guy just ask his god to conjure up a new module from a piece of the first one? Because that, that works yeah, for Adam, no, apparently. Yeah, they have. Yeah, spacecrafts have ribs, right? <laughs> so, as of now, the plan is to return the astronauts in early July, though NASA hasn't been any more specific than that. And yes, they're going to be returning aboard the same ship that they came on, a fact that I'm sure they're just <laughs> thrilled about. Uh, this is your captain speaking. We're going to need you to go figure out the problem on the wing real quick. Mm-hmm. The extra wing that we're throwing out. It's going to be fine. It almost killed you on the way here. Don't worry about it. And then after that, get um, back inside and fly your cell phone. I'm just a, I'm just a guy on a radio. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not flying it. Now, according to NASA, the ship can stay docked for 45 days before it'll be any problem and 72 days if using a backup system. That was the quote, if using a backup system. They don't specify what they meant by that, but I feel like the backup system in question is starvation rations and only shitting when you have no other choice. But that's where we're at. Or or it's killing the creationist guy. That's what it is. (laughs) 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 All right. And just a quick note before we close it out. We are very much aware that our Supreme Court ruled that uh, pure evil gavel gavel seven different times last week. Rest assured, we'll be talking about that on this show and probably The Scathing Atheist in the weeks to come. Spreading it out was strongly encouraged by a cardiologist. That's a medical professional. So thanks to No Illusions, thanks to Michael Marshall, and thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. 
And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like finally finished the backlog, hope to become your third favorite redacted. Jeffrey Boucher, a local laser artist looking for work in secular weddings. Randy Jordan, plant doctor. Jessica, rabid monk. Randy, Robert Hagar, Frio. Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves did gyre and gimbal in the Wabe, all Mimsy were the Borgoves, and the Momraths outgabe. Michael Blooding, Lynn, the Princess of Nothing, Sarah Norris, Frederick, Seizure Salad, A.W. Book Girl, Henri, Carl Jones, Balfour Cravens, Brad, Brycey Poo, David C. Bruce, Scatus X, Patrick Duggins, Esteban, Bacon Blinds, and Sean Tessier. You are the Isla Scotch and dark chocolate that pairs perfectly with another Isla Scotch. And we love you. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He is the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Marsh, calm down. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> Marsh, relax. I, I still have a voice left. Somehow I still have a voice left. <laughs> I'm not totally hoarse. We are recording this moments after the dramatic, ridiculous 95th minute of bicycle <laughs> kick, game tying goal, sending it to extra time, and then England winning. Marsh is very excited. I am very excited. Also, we were recording this uh, initially at half time in that game because I had completely fucked up telling you <laughs> telling you what time we needed to adjust to for the game. So you got. Oh no, you told me correctly, and I missed it. And then you were like, "Hey, man, it's uh, half time during the game. I can't do this right now. I, I uh, so we're losing one nothing." So I was like, "It'll either be an hour or it'll be some time <laughs> after that." And so I was keeping you guys uh, on the hook of like, uh, "Can we do like another half an hour or so while something happens in this match?" Oh, good lord! Well, and then and then we have the the overtime, and then we also had to wait for like an elation cool down because we've got to talk about the debate, and we've got to yes. talk about uh, you know just depressing, awful shit that's going on in the world. And and Marsh just could not like he couldn't get the smile out of his voice. <laughs> Marsh needs phone. to go do a riot with the rest of Liverpool right yeah. now. It's, it's fine. I'm just going to channel the first ninety three minutes of that game <laughs> and there the preceding two hundred and seventy. Hey, that's American politics right there. Yeah. You got it. Yeah, I was going to say you're also going to be talking about your election too, which is going to it's going to creep right back in when we do. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.